Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? We are so excited for our next guest today. Pierce Freelon is a musician, politician, activist, Emmy award-winning producer, entrepreneur, and basically a force of nature. His passion (laughs) for music has inspired his voice for change. He has been a professor in the Department of Political Science, Music, and African African American Studies at North Carolina University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also a father, husband, and serves on multiple boards. We love this. He is the writer, composer, and co-director of the animated series called History of White People in America, yay, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival as well as Beat Making Lab on PBS, which has won Best Video Essay for one of his episodes at the Daytime Emmy Awards. What don't you do? (laughs) We're about to to find out. Yeah, we are. (laughs) Wow, that's great. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, Yeah, what don't I do? Well, we're gonna get to it. We're gonna get into that. Jamie will get there. Okay, it was it was a rhetorical question. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Got it. (laughs) So, so the first question is: I thought it'd be interesting to think about your childhood in a creative Mm. way, since you're such a creative guy. Mm. And so, we were thinking about if we were listening at the uh, door of your house and kind of peering through the crack in the window. Mm. What lessons would we learn from your uh, upbringing? Ooh, we well. It depends on where I was. Uh, so I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so my first, my first thought was uh, 1522 Southwood Drive. Now, at that house, um, you would have heard just beyond that door a lot of little voices. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, you would have heard uh, some vinyl records, maybe some Earth, Wind, and Fire, some yes. James Brown, some. Uh, some Anita Baker, you might have heard some uh, some Pat Metheny, guitar jazz guitar player. Um, you would have uh, you would have heard uh, my parents um, passing down some uh, some wisdom, uh, sometimes uh, through song and through music, sometimes uh, you know through advice. You know, my dad uh, always encouraged us to to follow our passions and to find something that we love. Uh, so that's definitely a lesson that I, that I took to heart. Uh, and it's not just the lesson he gave us as kids. You know, it's, it's, these are things that my parents discussed. My mother um, was trained as a, like a, a nurse. She was a healthcare professional and, and had kids young. And I was probably two or three years old when she was, um, ready to kind of re-enter the workforce full time once I was, you know, off the preschool. And I remember, you know, conversations about what are you going to do next, Nina? You know, this is what my dad would say, you know, what are you going to do next? Uh, She had a passion for music. She had a passion for jazz and a creative way of healing. Like, you know, there's the medical healing, then there's the spiritual healing. And uh, and she made the very courageous choice to choose music, something that really filled her jazz music. And um, so you would you would have heard her practicing jazz standards. You would have heard us uh, being dragged to rehearsals and you know doing homework backstage. Um, you know, and and it was a beautiful thing to witness. My parents both uh, follow their dreams and to partner with one another in creating space for them to find abundance in the things that they cared about. Um, So yeah, that, that, that's what you would have heard. Then the the other home I was thinking about is in Cambridge, Massachusetts on Chilton street, where my mom's mom, her name was queen mother, Frances Pierce. She had so many isms that are still in my head. She said, 
lift as you climb. Mm. You know, black man, lift as you climb. She I said, just got uh, goosebumps. I just got mm. goosebumps. Yeah. Yo, she said, keep an mm. attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. You got a roof over your head? You got clothes on your back? You got food in your stomach? You better keep an attitude of gratitude, boy. That's what ah! you would have heard wow. up on the door. You would have heard. I'll give you one more. Uh, no is a love word. That's another one. Oof. No is a love word. You know. Man, I wish somebody had told my ex-wife that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that that's different lessons, but from the same loving place. That whether it's Chilton Street in Cambridge at Grandma's house, or or in Durham, North Carolina, on Southwood. There's the title of your book that you must write. Mm. I, I have to say that. I didn't expect such a powerful uh, yeah. response to that question, but it was perfect. Mm. Loved it. And now we see how you got to be who you are. That totally, <laughs> totally fits, makes sense now. Um, I want to go back to your TEDx from 2014. Okay. And I want to know if your response has changed to the question, in your words, what happens when you merge the world of art with activism? Mm. Well, I think the answer was love at the TEDx, uh, but uh, I think I have some other words that I would add to it. Um, abundance, um, transformation, uh, you know, enlightenment, <laughs> you know what I mean? Community. Yeah. Those are some words that I would add to it. Um, and, you know, when I think about, so, so we've talked about some of my ancestors. My dad is now an ancestor. My, my grandmother, Queen Mother Frances Pierce, she has transitioned to the land of love and, uh, and they still are very present in my life um, in a different way. Um, and those are my blood relatives, but I also have ancestors in my cultural through line. Mm. And, I, and I wanna attribute that, that phrasing to a, a black woman, sister, auntie, mentor of mine named Omisade Bernie Scott. She has a wonderful podcast called um, uh, Black Girl's Guide to Menopause. Um, <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, you've got, your, you've got your, your biological ancestors, then you've got the ancestors in your cultural through line. Who are those folks? I think about people like Polly Murray, um, who was a black queer Episcopal priest and social civil rights activist, lawyer and poet, you know what I mean? Look at all them hats. Yeah. Like I wrote the, the first draft of Brown versus Board of Education for Thurgood Marshall and I dropped bars at the, at the coffee shop, snap your fingers. Like, you know, get you somebody that can do both. Uh, you know, Durham native. I think about people like Ernie Barnes, who was a pro football player, but also a beautiful painter. He painted the um, the Marvin Gaye's famous album cover, you know, that, that appeared on, um, what was that television show? Good Times, was it? Oh, oh. Oh, yes. Um, the, the, the mural. Yeah, that, that yeah. mural. That's a mural of a, of a dance party in Durham, North Carolina, where Ernie Barnes is from. Um, you know, social rights activists, sorry, social, uh, civil rights activists, uh, uh, painter, uh, professional athlete, you know what I mean? He, he wore multitudes and, um, you know, whether it's uh, Nina Simone, another North Carolina native, I'm going to stay in my North Carolina bag right now. Okay. You know, social justice activists, art, art and activism um, merged together. You know, those are these are some of the folks that really kind of inspire uh, me and that I consider cultural uh, ancestors of mine. Uh, even though I never was able to meet them in person, their the legacies that they've left of uh, me and many others have been influential in my growth and development. Their mentorship through the the way that they live their lives mm -hmm. has been an inspiration to me. So, um, yeah, that's why I say community, abundance, um, all those things are what happens when you merge art and activism. I love it. One of mine is uh, Archbishop Carl Bean, mm. and uh, singer, writer, and uh, bishop uh, really reconnected me to my spirituality and nice. he's taught me so many lessons. So I feel you on the, uh, the, the community. And is, this a, is this an ancestor or are they still with no, us? No, no. 
he's with us, thank God. Yeah, okay, great. with us. Uh, he's incredible, you know, and, and many more, but you just made me think of him when you talk about abundance and love and guidance and all that. That's, that's everything that he represented. Um, well, please send me if you have a, I love learning about new folks. So if there's like a sermon on YouTube or something oh, yeah. that you think is real powerful that you could share, please share it with me. Yeah, for sure. I will definitely do that. I hope to stay connected to you. You got, you have a lot going on. That's so interesting. We were in awe. Um, you know, what you're talking about has to do with uh, nurturing mental health as well. Hmm. And, you know, it's been such a uh, challenge in our community. And I've been on the front line of it for over 20 years, of trying to destigmatize mental health mm. in our community. And because we, we deserve it, mm. uh, that's where, we, where I come from with it. And it's been a challenge because of how systems are built. You know, they're oppressive and they are, are, have systemic problems. But I, I like what you're saying because it is connected to maintaining mental health. So I just mm. wanna know if you have any additional thoughts on um, mental health in the black community? Yeah, I think, um, you know, black folks are dealing with all types of traumas because of the systems of oppression that you've discussed. Um, and there are also ancestral traumas that we just carry in our Absolutely. bones. From transgenerational. Mm -hmm. We call it transgenerational. Mm. And so the, the, the woman that I referenced who clearly needs to be on your show, like yes. just call her as soon as we hop off. Omi Shade, I'll, I'll mention something else that I learned from her. She told me that, um, I just posted about this on Instagram a couple of days ago in my stories. She said, you know, we don't just carry ancestral trauma. That's something I think folks talk about a lot now. We also carry our ancestral resiliency. Yes. And um, remembering that has been really important in my mental health uh, journey and just sitting in gratitude for the sacrifices that our ancestors made to, to create possibility and abundance for, for me. Um, but, you know, I think that, I think that it's tough. We haven't always had the tools or even kind of the cultural context to be able to uh, understand and diagnose mental health issues. Uh, to know where to seek help, you know, whether it's, you know, pray the pain away or, you know, sometimes you need a therapist. You don't yeah. need to, prayer alone might not uh, provide you with the uh, care that you need right. to um, to overcome uh, some of the trauma that folks have experienced. Absolutely. Um, and particularly for me as a, as a Black man, um, there's certain, you know, stigmas against vulnerability and, and mental health challenges that are in opposition to what, you know, patriarchal version of black masculinity is supposed to be. Exactly. Um, and the most, you know, stereotypical example of that is, you know, don't cry, you know, yes. young boy that that's, I've, I've been told that in fact, as recently as two, three years ago, um, one of my mentors passed away and I was, grieving him and a community celebration and just weeping because I missed him. Um, and a brother came up to me, he's like, man, you know, don't, don't do that here. Like, don't show that. Uh, and I looked at him like, <laughs> while I was crying, I was like, <laughs> <that what> you, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I didn't let it, you know, luckily I, 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 um, I had the, I had the, the, the confidence and the, and the knowledge of how healthy it was for me to be, be vulnerable in that moment, to not like take it personally or anything. But the thought occurred to me later, like, ooh, I, I wonder who else, you know, who might be younger or might not have the same kind of understanding that I do, that this brother is influencing, who he could be you know, shutting off a valve that needs to be opened. And, you know, what's, what, what's going to happen if that just bubbles up and explodes? Right. Like, nah, they need to be able to turn that, turn the waterworks all the way on when they need yeah. to come on and feel the feels and, and embrace that and support each other. He didn't come up to me and say, hey, brother, man, how can I help you in this moment? Yeah. Like, you know, he said, stop crying. Like, yeah. So that that's a that is an ongoing issue, um, you know, because he, you know, with my stature in the community, he didn't want me to seem weak in that moment. I 
I don't think for a second he was trying to be harmful to me. Right. He was right. trying to look out, but uh, not realizing that what he was offering me was uh, poisonous, <laughs> you know, but that's what he got from his dad and probably from his granddad. So, yeah, this, look, yeah, my generation, yeah. My generation same mm. thing, you know, I, I was a crier. And it was mm. always like, stop, people don't think you're weak. You can't mm -hmm. let them see your weakness. Yep. And so absolutely, I feel you on that. I want to validate what you're saying. It's, a, it's, it's part of our culture and it's a part of our culture that hasn't worked for us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, look, our, our mental health is greatly impacted by what's going on in society. Mm -hmm. You know, white supremacy reigns uh, in a way that we've never seen it reign so boldly before. And as you said, you know, um, transgenerational trauma, um, I, I'm th not think, I can't think of the, uh, the author's name right now, but she calls it post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome. Mm. And interesting book and interesting theory on how it plays itself out through a, uh, an African-American lens, which is really great because, you know, psychologically, the psychological institution has, hasn't caught up, hasn't caught up. It's got its mm. own oppressive system. So it's so interesting to hear clinicians who teach and think from that multicultural lens, which is absolutely what I believe in what I do. But our question for you is, you know, you've worked in politics. I mean, you've had access to everything that has been uh, oppressive by the system of supremacy. How, mm. how have you survived it? I mean, what mm. I, I understand, you know, so you sort of spoke to that already, but what have you done to, uh, to protect yourself? And what mm. have you seen in terms of how whiteness protects itself? Mm. Well, first, could, could I, could I, I think you said something that I want to, that I want to get your thoughts on. Okay. Um, you said that, uh, and I, and I do want to answer your question because no, I think. I, it's fine. I love this exchange. Okay, great. So, well, first, yeah, I want to get into basically what, what I'm going to answer is, is what are my healing rituals when I get into a space that's toxic or when I'm dealing with some you know, with some folks who've been traumatized by the system that we're talking about. I definitely, I've been going through that recently as we're having the discussion in Durham about policing and, right. you know, I want to talk about that. But first, uh, I just want to address, and as you were asking the question, you said that we're experiencing white supremacy, like to an extent that it's never been seen before. And I just want to, I don't know, I want to, I want to offer that our ancestors dealt with a whole lot of white supremacy, you know, and uh, and the 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 indiscriminate, just genocidal, unapologetically blatant violence of chattel slavery. <laughs> uh, it we've seen this before. Yes, absolutely. Let me, let me reframe that. Right. I mean literally the dominant white culture hasn't seen it before mm. uh, visibly on cameras uh, daily. And the younger generation who's not being taught their history mm. hasn't seen it the way they see it on social media daily. Mm. We carry the pain of what our ancestors have experienced and seen and their ancestors have seen it, but I'm talking about yeah. this generation. This generation, this okay, got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so, yeah. No, but I, appreciate, I appreciate you saying that and, and pushing me to clarify, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, and to the, here's the other thing, too, about the seeing, you know, for this generation, that, that is an important distinction. But, you know, if you go back and look at, you know, lynchings, for example, they saw the violence. Yeah. They, are, they were the violence. They were invited to it. They were invited to it. They reveled in it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's an interesting book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, okay. Paolo uh, Freire, right? Well, yeah. Swear by him, teach from him. Love him. Mm, mm. And, and here was, you know, the gem for me in that book was about the, the, <laughs> the awesome responsibility of the oppressed to free themselves and their oppressors. Because let's not get it twisted. It, it, it's obviously very harmful for a person to commit a violent act ag uh, uh, against another person. That, that's harmful to the person who is being um, violated. Um, but that act is also harmful against the perpetrator of that violence and, uh, their, their quality of life, their ancestral line is also interrupted for having participated in that. And they've got some work to do in healing to do as well. 
around the reckoning for the violence that they committed against and continue to commit against yeah. black bodies. Right. And um, that, that, that concept never really dawned on me until I read that book and understood that it's only those you know, at, at, who've experienced that violence who can do the healing for themselves and in doing so also heal their oppressors. What a, what a, <laughs> what a burden, but also what a, just what an interesting way that the universe is kind of shaped in this way, you know? You know but here's the thing about that. I, I, you know, and I, I don't think you'll disagree. The idea that the African-American community has been trying to heal the oppressor mm -hmm. for, you know, hundreds of years. You mm -hmm. can, if you are a white person who comes into a black space and you act like you're good to be there, I have never seen anybody harassed or harmed unless you're coming in as a part of the state to do some damage to a family. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have seen more oppressive acts when I've been uh, my black face in a white space than I have vice versa. So mm -hmm. I feel like we've been trying to do that role modeling of healing for hundreds of years. I yep. now feel like it hasn't worked out. Mm -hmm. So my language has changed to a much more assertive one, yeah. which is that, you know, this is your war on yeah. white supremacy, white people. Yep. Yep. I need you to figure out what you need to do mm -hmm. to deconstruct and reformulate those systems that your ancestors mm -hmm. built. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that in an angry way. It's just yeah. like we tried to. No, you're people. saying it in a factual way. You right. Tried, <laughs> you tried to be. You, you know, you, you've had the idea of being my ally while I showed you how. And we are still here. Yeah. You know, 21st century, we're still here. So now mm -hmm. I've got to pass it back to you and say, you figure out yeah. what needs to be done. You know, because yeah. I, I feel like we've done our part where, where that is. But I love the spiritual context of what you're saying. I'm just feeling much more pushy about it these days. Yeah. Well, but you know, I just, I want to say, because I met JD when mm. she was my professor in grad school, my mm. one black lesbian professor who taught multicultural mental health through mm. this lens. Mm. And when I stood up first day and said, I'm an ally. And she was mm. like, what does that even mean? Mm. And I think people are just using these words now when they're seeing it and they're witnessing it, but they don't understand it mm -hmm. and they don't realize that they have to unlearn. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, part of why I, I gravitated so closely to JD is because, and you do the same thing, is speaking the truth mm -hmm. yeah. and speaking yeah. the truth. And on that note, I'm going to, I'm going to move on. Is that okay, JD? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not, unless, not unless Pierce, you wanted to say something else. About Did it. you want to say anything else about that? Well, uh, I guess I, I hadn't answered your question yet, but I can just very quickly, uh, you know, how do I navigate this, those types of spaces personally? And for folks who, you know, are interested in getting into politics or who are committed to movement work, whether it's cultural movement work or political work or, uh, you know, the work of transformation, it's important that we protect ourselves. And, yeah. um, you know, going back to my grandmother's wisdom, no is a love word is really, really important. Knowing when and how and where to say no and to know that you can wield that, you have that agency at all times to protect yourself mm -hmm. is really important. So no is a love word is, is something that, that is with me often. Um, did y'all hear about uh, Naomi Osaka, the black uh, yeah. tennis pro who pulled out of the French Open because she didn't want to do interviews? Yep. Like yeah. that to me was so inspiring um, because it's an extension of that same value. It's yeah. that the, this capitalist, uh, you know, thing that has brought me success and fame is not going to control me because my mental health, my peace is too important. There is no check that you can cut that is worth me devaluing my soul and Stop selling my soul. Listen, and that's, you know, that's in the tradition of Muhammad Ali. Yes. It's in the tradition of Colin Kaepernick. It's in the tradition right. of Althea Gibson and Arthur Ashe. And, you know, so, so she's not alone in that, but it's, it's important to hear and be reminded that no is a love word. It's a word primarily to self. I love it. You know, so 
So that would be, there are other like little rituals I'll do. I do breathing exercises. Hey, if I'm in a council meeting where somebody is spewing kind of venom or vitriol, you know, I don't carry that. I go to the river and I dip my toes in the water and I pray to my ancestors and to Oshun and she takes it away. If I didn't have that ritual, I would just be going to bed with like all little it. stuff, little fragments of their negative energy all over me. Look, you know? I have to say two things to this before you take over. One is that we should have never left the South. That's mm. number one. <laughs> and number two is, I don't know if you caught the nuances that in some articles they led with her being Japanese and in mm. other articles they led with her being black. I thought mm. that was interesting. It was like yeah. whatever worked best for how they were slanting it in the media, mm. which is another tool of the oppressor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the last thing I wanted to say was uh, my favorite thing, or uh, the thing that has led me with uh, uh, pedagogy of the press is the idea that the oppressor has taught us to fight over the crumb that exists. You know, this mm -hmm. idea that it's tossed in the middle, and we are put against, we are put up against each other. It's happening right now with the Asian community and the African American community because of the Asian hate crime bill. You know, this idea that one gets something the other one should have, and then that takes the attention off of the dominant culture and has us checking each other. Mm -hmm. It's such a viable tool that continues to work throughout history. Yep. I wanted to share that thought with you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sue. Sorry, I got excited. I'm just it. still holding on to no is a love word because I oh, always yeah. say no is a boundary. So I really like, <laughs> I'm going to change my language. So thank you. <laughs> Hey, thank um, my grandma. She's here. I feel your like grandma is, is here, and we are celebrating her. <laughs> um, okay, so tell us about your motivation for your music, like Daddy Daughter Day, your song "My Body," when art and activism make love. Other music in the Revenge of the Afronauts album, just to name a few of those. Tell us about because we listened and watched, and what inspires you? What motivates you? Uh, well, all the things we've already talked about. Um, I'm in Thank regular you. communication with my ancestors. I'm influenced by my mentors on this world and the next. Um, you know, the people, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, Nina Simone today. I mentioned the poetry of Polly Murray, um, the artwork of Ernie Barnes, uh, the wisdom of my grandmother. These things um, really help shape who I am and how I move in the world. And uh, when I create, um, I'm pouring from that same vessel, you know? Uh, it's a pitcher that is overflowing with abundance, as you can see, see yeah. I'm doing a lot yeah. of stuff. And, uh, you know, when I put my pen to a page or I get on my computer and I'm composing uh, and I'm writing, uh, what what pours out is 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 from that same space. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you know of the projects you mentioned. I've recently been making music for children, and um, I just released an album called Black to the Future. I know. I'm going <laughs> to ask you about that. Oh uh, uh, yeah, and there's there's a song on there. Speaking of influencers, there's a song on there called Lavar Burton, and I just dropped a video for <laughs> you. You just yesterday. got my whole question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Look, look. No, at me. it's great. Go, no, go, go for but, it. I mean, but you know, so I grew up. I grew up in a. You know, my my, my parents were both what you would call nerds. <laughs> you know, they part of what helped them connect was uh, they had never met another black person who had read the book Dune by Frank Herbert. And uh, yeah, and uh, you know they were both really into Star Trek, the original series with Kirk and Spock, you know, and Uhura, um, and so they 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 shared this kind of like, oh, what what you know about Dune? Like you watch Star <laughs> Trek? Okay, like you know, uh, later Octavia Butler, like you know, the, this was an area of shared interest where they had only. Um, they had only found white peers to share this type of thing with. And here was another black person with whom they shared a cultural fluency and this uh, deep love uh, for science fiction. And so that, that Afrofuturist space before the, coin was, the term was coined in the 90s, you know, my parents really raised us in that. And when I think about someone like LeVar Burton, uh, who has deeply influenced my life as a, as a cultural um, uh, icon, 
you know, I watched Reading Rainbow growing up mm-hmm. um, on PBS. Uh, my, my grandmother had the whole, like, epi- every episode of Roots was in a box set at her house. She popped it in. We were wow. in there like, yeah, what is this? You know, like, <laughs> exactly. at the time it was like, this is intense, you know, but uh, she, she wanted us to know our history. And wow. so that was obviously a very important project in that regard. And then, of, of course... Star Trek, The Next Generation, you know, this brother was a blind uh, engineer, the smartest brother on the ship. And um, whereas some depictions of black masculinity that I saw in the media were very macho, you know, it was LL Cool J or Shaft, which was one of my dad's favorite movies. You know, here's this guy who's kind of nerdy. He's not so savvy you know, in, in relationships and he's really into science and engineering and, and here he was just uh, courageous and uh, funny and vulnerable and a good friend. And I knew a lot of people like him and mm-hmm. I saw myself in him. And so, uh, you know, that, that when, I'm, when I get in front of a, a creative process and, and making art, um, those are the things that pour out, the things that make me smile, the things that make me cry, the things that uh, inspire me. And so that's what you'll hear on, uh, on this new project, Black to the Future. Well, we heard a little and congratulations. I, it you. said that you had just launched it 20 hours ago. So we were like, wow, very, very cool. And that LeVar was your favorite um, character in Roots. Oh yeah, I mean, Kunta Kente, like, and he still lives in the, here's the thing, it's intergenerational. So, you know, Roots came out in 1977. I was born in 83. So, um, you know, but but it was a part of my childhood, a formative part of of my education about what chattel slavery was and what was before it. The craziest part of Roots to me are the scenes before they were enslaved, you know, and, uh, uh, of course, Star Trek and Reading Rainbow as well. But, um, you know, Kunta Kente lives in the, in the lore and the popular imagination of, of most millennials who, who are making music, and remember, have some kind of connection and relationship. Kendrick Lamar, who's my favorite living rapper, um, yeah. you know, he had a song called King Kunta, you know, uh, uh, on his, uh, I can't remember if that was on To Pimp a Butterfly or if, yeah, To Pimp a Butterfly, which is also probably one of the most iconic hip hop albums of the past 20 years. Um, you know, so so these characters that, that he depicted and portrayed, you know, they exist. You, you, you do your art. And, and I love how LeVar has, ch- the, the, the scripts and the characters and the shows that he's chosen to invest his brand in all have similar themes of kind of, of education and uplifting storytelling. Um, but yeah, these characters, after you do your part to pour into those characters, they live on. Yes. You know, yes. Jordy, Jordy LaForge lives in my mind as a, as a, as a person, you know, that I can interact and remember having, you know, been around difficult moments in his life. You know, our brains don't have the same capacity to distinguish a memory of with an individual versus a memory with a piece of art. It's the same fondness. It's the same, you know, so I have a relationship with these characters and that's why it's important for us as people to be conscientious about the types of content and media that we consume. Um, You know, if you're watching and listening to music that is violent or misogynist, that becomes a part of your lexicon. It becomes normalized to you. And I think that's one of the ways that white supremacy has weaponized black culture against us. Uh, And so a lot of my art and music, especially the stuff I make for children, you know, it's to create a different narrative that is not just about entertainment. It's about reshaping the narrative of what black masculinity is, what black fatherhood is, what, um, you know, what's possible um, in a, through a, through a black lens, through a radical loving black lens um and i definitely appreciate and study and enjoy listening to artists that have that same um that same desire to pour 
love and enlightenment and community into their music. Um, Kendrick Lamar is definitely one of those uh, contemporary artists who does that. Um, Stevie Wonder did that. You know, Janelle Monae like did Nas that. Did too. I feel like Nas did too. Totally. You yeah. know, but Nas is an interesting character. So Nas is probably my favorite rapper. Not probably. He's he hands down my favorite rapper. <laughs> but, you know, Nas has some, Nas has, some, as an adult going back, you know, when DMX died a couple of weeks ago, I had a similar experience. I grew up listening to, idolizing, loving this man's lyrics. And then I go back and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, as I'm grieving, I'm like, wow, the dog was really, you know, he was really out there on some topics. But, you know, it, it's... <laughs> that it's important, I think, to, as for me, as a creator, to put things out that reflect the world I wanna see. But it's also important for black folks to share the pain and struggle yeah. of their experiences. So you. both are important. Yeah. But let me just add one more thing. Thank you for saying that so much because when it is judged by the white dominant culture so often, I mean, Susie and I got it into it with a really popular person because they were judging one of the people in our community who speaks to women, right? Uh, a famous rapper who speaks to women and putting uh, the judgment on it from the white feminist perspective. And I had to take it on because I wanna say, you don't get to judge the heroes in our community, right. whether it is uh, what people consider violent, like you said, it's about their pain or it's loving like you, expressive and educational like Nas and Kendrick, it comes from a place and, and you don't get to judge that place. <laughs> witness, witness that place, but you don't get to judge it. And that's something that I wanna you know, emphasize. We get to figure it out, right. but you don't get to figure it out for us. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. Okay, black futurism mm -hmm. as default white Genius. Bridging the, div the the digital divide, Afrofuturism, amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us about black space and why it's so important to you. And and during this last year, how COVID has impacted this yeah. project. Well, yeah, for your listeners that may not be familiar, Black Space is a digital makerspace in Durham. Um, it's a community center uh, for Black youth where we train them up in music production and sound design and storytelling and coding. And um, the reason that uh, I created Black Space, co-created it with many members of our beloved community here in Durham is because I wanted the I wanted our kids to have privileged access to their to the abundance that already exists within them. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of our kids have stories to tell, but they don't know, you know, they they, they haven't been given that, um, you know, that as uh, M.K. Asante says, that blank page in the notebook. They haven't been given. Um, you know, they don't have access to the studio spaces and the, uh, the, the fluencies and music production or even the access to a quality laptop that can allow you to put these pieces together. And, um, but we got stories to tell, Yes. you know, but we got stories to tell. So I wanted to eliminate that gap and make sure our kids were equipped with the tools and the platform that they need to tell their own stories but also the skills, like you walk away from a woke shop at Black Space, not just with the creative product, but with a set of skills that you can use to get work, you uh, know, to mix audio at a podcast or to do an internship at a television studio, as some of our students have done with UNC, with PBS North Carolina, um, or uh, Nasher, uh, what do they call Full Frame, the Full Frame documentary film uh, festival in Durham has done uh, collaborations where we train our kids up in documentary filmmaking and storytelling. I love with, it. I said PBS North Carolina. I meant WUNC, not PBS. NPR is the, NPR. Uh, okay. is the body. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, I say that all to say, um, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that all of our kids deserve 
access to those types of privileged spaces, but so often those that abundance is only afforded to you know the lucky, talented tenth, you know, for lack of yeah. a better term, to use a Du Boisian uh, term. Um, I was definitely a part of that. I remember going to college. I'm looking around. I'm like, yo, this is like a grocery store, a music studio, a blockbuster video, and a, and a gym membership in one. Like, what's going on? Yeah. I can't believe it. There's an Olympic swimming pool, an yeah. uh, uh, unlimited DVD collection, and a studio that you can access for free. You could just roll up in there and swipe your card and you're in there. And I'm like, how is this possible? Why is it that people that I went to high school with don't get access to this? You know, that was really my first kind of understanding of like, wow, I'm privileged. Like, this is really wild. And it's just accessible. People don't even use it. It just sits there collecting dust yeah. while kids I know who could, wow. whose lives could be changed by this resource that's two blocks from their house that's being gentrified because they live close to a university could access and change their whole situation. Or they're gonna shell out, you know, they're working at set for $7 an hour and are gonna shell out hundreds of dollars to buy a studio time at a professional spot because they don't, you know, it's just about access. So it's I nice. just wanted that that university caliber of resource to be available and accessible to black children at all times. That's what it. they, that's what they deserve. That's what, that's what they, de that's what we deserve. Yeah. I don't deserve that just because my parents paid my college tuition. You know what I mean? Like, and then when I first taught at an HBCU, I was like, where's all the stuff that was at UNC? Yeah. Right. What happened? I thought this was, a, oh, no, that's a predominantly white institution. Okay, got it. Got it, got it, got it. Michael Jordan gave $10 million to UNC and $1 million to Morehouse in Atlanta. That's got it. Okay, so we don't have that same luxury at a historically black college or university. You know, that's, uh, that's interesting. Like, so understanding that by living it and observing critically. But anyway, yeah, that, that's why I created Black Space and, you know, and the kids have, have created so much dope art from it. Congratulations, awesome. Um, tell us about your film, History of Black People in America. Oh, it's, it's white people, yeah. I meant white people, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about black people in America. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, fact, well, you know, yeah. yeah, it goes back to JD, something you were talking about, about, you know, even in the title, you know, this is the history of white people. White people created black and they created white. Mm -hmm. That is a, uh, <laughs> that is a facsimile that was concocted by white folks with an agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and what was that agenda? Well, divide and conquer. Um, genocide was a, part, a big part of that agenda, chattel slavery. Um, yeah, violent ripping of bodies and resources and land and the environment. Um, that was the agenda. And they couldn't do it without white. They needed white because the struggle prior to their creating this imaginary system was rich versus poor. Right. It was broke, Irish, Scottish, African folks, indentured servants who weren't getting their fair share, rising up collectively against the British crown. And then those British folks said, man, how can we prevent that from happening again? Burning down Jamestown and Bacon's Rebellion, uh, this kind of multiracial solidarity thing needs to stop. Hold up. If we can separate these groups 
then we've got something we can work with. And that was when it was after Bacon's Rebellion. That was the first time white appeared in a legal document in the colonies. And it was, <laughs> it was about marriage. It was a marriage bill. Y'all can't, no, anti-miscegenation. Y'all can't marry. That's how we begin the divide. And then the pseudoscience around, oh, well, your brain is this size and you're yeah. Anglo-Saxon and you're Ethiopian and, you know, all that BS pseudoscience came later mm -hmm. um, after they figured out that this is a winning strategy for um, taking land from indigenous people and getting black people to work it for free. They told the poor white people, you know, you don't get to elevate to our status, but at least you'll be better than them. Exactly. You can be the overseers and, and have a, and have a, you know, it, it's uh, not so different from a, you know, a caste system. It's a racial caste. Exactly. And, uh, and, and who was allowed into that sphere of whiteness has expanded over time mm -hmm. as the, you know, as the numbers have, you know, Jewish people weren't considered white, Irish folks, they weren't considered white until later when it was necessary for them to be assimilated into the majority in order for them to maintain the same type of control that, 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 uh, and access and privilege that they'd grown accustomed to. Yeah. And so that is a very like kind of academic overview of what the series is about, but we tell the story through hip hop and animation and uh it really looks at a series of uh moments chronologically through history from bacon's rebellion to the present um to tell this story um of how whiteness was created why it was created and how it's changed over time amazing thank you thank you i'm gonna let jd ask the last question, but we both just thank you so much. You're incredible. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you have to agree to come back, please. I promise, <laughs> of course. I promise we'll, we'll get together in terms of timing. <laughs> no, this, this, has been will, this time we'll get you the right time and date and link, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. So sorry for the confusion, as I said. Before, no problem. More importantly, uh, you know, what you have to say is so important. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I, I just really appreciate, first of all, I appreciate, appreciate your energy. You know, I, I'm much more like, Ugh. I don't have that same calm and ease and connection to the groundedness that you do. I so appreciate that. At my age, I lost a lot of that and I'd love to find it again, but I just feel that sense of urgency. So I'm always trying JD, to- you can't JD. Lose you, JD, you can't lose JD. We need that. Well, it just, you know, you, you live long enough and things start to wear down and that's what's happened to me. So I really appreciate your energy. It, it, it helps in telling the story. You know, the narratives that you, that you, uh, you tell in story are so important and the way you do it is so inviting. So that's what I want to share. Thank and you. also um, tell everybody what's next. Like, where do they find you? How do they get access to you? Because I, I, I looked for you and, and found you and then just started pestering until I was able to get in. So I want people to know how to find you and, and, and what's up next. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and for holding space for this uh, enriching conversation. I definitely would be happy to come back. Um, you know, everything is easy, pretty easy to find. Um, my name is Pierce Freelon and that is how I show up on every social media platform no funky spellings, no kind of weird, you know, anything. So it's, you know, Instagram slash Pierce Freelon, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, you know, and my website is piercefreelon.com. So if you're interested in kind of learning more, getting in contact, um, you know, my email is there. My um, uh, publicist, Stephanie, is accessible there uh, and social media as well. Prim my primary Social media platform is probably Instagram. Um, sometimes I'll look at my Facebook messages and I'll say, oh, I haven't been here for six months. I wonder what's been going on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, 
that that's not something I check very often. Um, but you know, Instagram I check, email I check, so uh, that's how people can get up with me. Well, I'm glad you checked your DM when I hit you up. <laughs> the right direction. Um, so the last question is, and you've said it in a number of ways, but I just want you to summarize it. What does change the narrative mean to you? Mm. Change the narrative uh, means to me, speak your truth. Yes. Um, unapologetically uh, and with, um, with the um, unique authenticity that only you can bring. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first track uh, on my album is, is sung by my mother. It's called No One Exactly Like You. And, and that's what she says. There's no, there's no, she's talking to kids. There's no one exactly like you. Um, each person has a specialness that's different from anyone else. And then she goes into the song. But, um, you know, that's what changing the narrative is about. The narrative, um, you know, you shape your own narrative when you speak. And uh, as Octavia Butler says, you know, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change changes you. So to change the narrative, literally, if you if, if every if you change when you speak, you know, then then the the act of speaking will change the narrative. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, shouts to Octavia Butler, who is an amazing. For those I mentioned her name earlier, but I didn't say who she was. She was a science fiction writer, um, and just one of the most prolific. Uh, writers in the genre of science fiction, but told stories mostly centered around black women protagonists. Yeah. And um, it was just such an eloquent and, and powerful and futuristic storyteller. And um, yeah, so, so her quote, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, changes you. Uh, is really important. The, 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 it goes on to say the only lasting truth is change. God has changed. Mm. And um, I've observed that to be true in the universe. And JD, going back to your earlier question about how I find peace in some of the difficult work that I do around change, especially in politics, is to remember that God has changed, mm. that um, change can be painful. I was, I've got two kids. Uh, empathy for my wife that <laughs> that that looked really hard <laughs> like you know but but i can't think of a time when i've been closer to god than looking at that change occur yes and it was bloody and it was violent and it was scary and we made it right you know and you know that's just the nature of change it's it, it's difficult and um and god is there uh, in it, uh, intrinsically, the Almighty, whatever God means to you, you know. Right, right. I'm not, you know, not, and I'm not. I'm not talking about God in a, in a traditional Judeo-Christian right, right. context, but mm -hmm. you know, there is a higher power present when things are changing, and and those changes are disruptive, um, and that disruption is in service to something new being created. Um, and that, that change is a, is, a, is a holy thing, whether it's a exploding star creating heavy elements to make the stuff that uh, we can touch and feel and interact with in the universe, or in, in, its, in the microcosm, you know, a, a, a child being born. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good good note to end on. That's excellent. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, I so appreciate you. Thanks for bringing your energy, your knowledge, your wisdom, all of who you are. And uh, thanks for saying you're going to come back. So I will be pestering you. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I need that quote, quote, the first quote from your grandmother again. We got uh, no is love and gratitude attitude, but the one before that. She said... Lift as you climb. That's it. That mm. one. Bam. I've Let's heard go. gratitude attitude with that one. Oof. Lift as you climb. That's the one. That hits home. Thank you, brother.
Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye. Be well. Talk to you soon.